This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy Book Six, After Courses 2. Thomason Walks in a Green Place by the Roman Road Klim saw little of Thomasin for several days after this, and when they met, she was more silent than usual. At length he asked her what she was thinking of so intently. "'I'm thoroughly perplexed,' she said candidly. "'I cannot for my life think who it is that Diggory Venn is so much in love with. None of the girls at the Maypole were good enough for him, and yet she must have been there.' Klim tried to imagine Venn's choice for a moment, but, ceasing to be interested in the question, he went on again with his gardening. No clearing up of the mystery was granted her for some time. But one afternoon, Thomasin was upstairs, getting ready for a walk, when she had occasion to come to the landing and call, Rachel! Rachel was a girl about thirteen who carried the baby out for airings and she came upstairs at the call. "'Have you seen one of my last new gloves about the house, Rachel?' inquired Thomasin. "'It's the fellow to this one.' Rachel did not reply. "'Why don't you answer?' said her mistress. "'I think it's lost, ma'am.' "'Lost? Who lost it? I've never worn them but once.' Rachel appeared as one dreadfully troubled, and at last began to cry. "'Please, ma'am, on the day of the Maypole I had none to wear, and I seed yours on the table, and I, I thought I would borrow em. I didn't mean to hurt em at all, but one of em got lost. Somebody gave me some money to buy another pair for you, but I've not been able to go anywhere to get em. "'Who's somebody?' "'Mr. Van.' Did he know it was my glove? Yes, I told him. Thomasin was so surprised by the explanation that she quite forgot to lecture the girl who glided silently away. Thomasin did not move further than to turn her eyes upon the grass plot where the maypole had stood. She remained thinking, then said to herself, that she would not go out that afternoon, but would work hard at the baby's unfinished, lovely, plaid frock, cut on the cross, in the newest fashion. How she managed to work hard, and yet do no more than she had done at the end of two hours, would have been a mystery to anyone, not aware that the recent incident was of a kind likely to divert her industry from a manual to a mental channel. Next day she went her ways, as usual, and continued her custom of walking in the heath with no other companion than little Eustacia, now of the age when it's a matter of doubt with such characters whether they are intended to walk through the world on their hands or on their feet, so that they get into painful complications by trying both. It was very pleasant to Thomasin, when she had carried the child to some lonely place, to give her a little private practice on the green turf and shepherd's time, which formed a soft mat to fall headlong upon when equilibrium was lost. Once, when engaged in this system of training, and stooping to remove bits of stick, fern stalks, and other such fragments from the child's path, that the journey might not be brought to an untimely end by some insuperable barrier a quarter of an inch high, she was alarmed by discovering that a man on horseback was almost close beside her, the soft natural carpet having muffled the horse's tread. The rider, who was Venn, waved his hat in the air and bowed gallantly. "'Diggory, give me my glove,' said Thomasin, whose manner it was, under any circumstances, to plunge into the midst of a subject which engrossed her. Venn immediately dismounted, put his hand in his breast pocket, and handed the glove. 
thank you. It was very good of you to take care of it. It is very good of you to say so. Oh, no, I was quite glad to find you had it. Everybody gets so indifferent that I was surprised to know you thought of me. If you had remembered what I was once, you wouldn't have been surprised. Ah, oh, no, she said quickly. But men of your character are mostly so independent. What is my character? he asked. I don't exactly know, said Thomas in simply. Except it is to cover up your feelings under a practical manner, and only to show them when you are alone. Ah, how do you know that? said Venn strategically. Because, said she, stooping, stopping to put the little girl who had managed to get herself upside down, right end up again, because I do. You mustn't judge by folks in general, said Venn. Still, I don't know much what feelings are nowadays. I've got so mixed up with business of one sort and t'other, that my soft sentiments are gone off in vapour like. Yes, I'm given up body and soul to the making of money. Money is all my dream. Oh, Diggory, how wicked, said Thomasin reproachfully, and looking at him in exact balance between taking his words seriously and judging them as said to tease her. Yes, tis rather a rum course, said Venn in the bland tone of one comfortably resigned to sins he could no longer overcome. You, who used to be so nice. Well, that's an argument I rather like, because what a man has once been, he may be again. Thomasin blushed. Except that it's rather harder now, Venn continued. Why? she asked because you be richer than you were at that time. Oh, no, not much. I've made it nearly all over to the baby, as it was my duty to do, except just enough to live on. I'm rather glad of that, said Venn softly, and regarding her from the corner of his eye. For it makes it easier for us to be friendly. Thomasin blushed again, and when a few more words had been said of a not unpleasing kind, Venn mounted his horse and rode on. This conversation had passed in a hollow of the heath near the old Roman road, a place much frequented by Thomasin, and it might have been observed that she did not in future walk that way less often from having met Venn there now. Whether or not Venn abstained from riding thither, because he had met Thomasin in the same place, might easily have been guessed from her proceedings about two months later, in the same year. End of chapter 2